Well, once we've established our personal relationship with Jesus and taken him as our Lord and Savior, and then we've received the empowering gift that he promised, the gift of the Holy Spirit, then we're in a position where we can really now begin to uh, live the life that Jesus wants us to live. And uh, I want us to see together that this is an alternate lifestyle. It's going to be very different from what we had lived before. It's going to be very different from the life that people are living around us. And so that's why we're calling tonight's session an alternate lifestyle. And uh, I want to start right off. We're going to describe this alternate lifestyle somewhat. But I want you to write in your notes at the very beginning the key to this alternate lifestyle is basically this. We are to be his witnesses. That is what he has called us to do, to be his witnesses. And here's what he told the disciples before he left in Acts 1. He said, But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to preach with great effect to the people in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth about my death and resurrection. Whatever else was to take, taking place in the people's lives, who came to follow him, and whom we find described in the New Testament, whatever else was happening, the main thing, their primary role was this. They were now, from now on, they were to be witnesses unto him. And so we find that wherever they went, they made a difference. They created a stir. People either responded or they got mad and, and kicked them out, but they couldn't just take them, you know, take them for granted. I mean... They had to do something with these people who came because they came bringing this tremendous message. And as they they went, and as God poured out his spirit, and more and more people became Christians, we we, we found that that God had to bring the uh, persecution, the boot of persecution down upon the fire that was created there in Jerusalem to spread it. Just like when you stomp on a fire, it spreads the coals, it spreads the sparks, and we start other fires. So it was that persecution came to Jerusalem because, as we saw in this uh, word that, that Jesus had given his disciples, uh, they weren't just to stay in Jerusalem, but they were to witness to him in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then in Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. So to get that process moving, persecution came. But soon it was, within one generation, most of the known world of that day began to hear about Jesus and within one century it had tur- they had, these people had turned that world upside down on its ear because they had this fire burning in them they had this desire that was now prompted by the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit came they were frightened hiding themselves afraid of the enemies now they gave a bold witness And that's what the Lord wants to see happen in our lives as well. And uh, so you see in your notes it says that there are four basic elements to the New Testament lifestyle. And in these verses, the early verses there in Acts chapter 2, in these verses we find kind of a little summary of what is going to be contained in the rest of the book. And we see the basic aspects of the lifestyle that these early Christians lived. So... Read with me, will you? Uh, Down through this, okay? They joined with the other believers in regular attendance of the apostles' teaching sessions at the communion services and prayer meetings. A deep sense of awe was upon them all. And the apostles did many miracles, and all the believers met together constantly, constantly and shared everything with each other, selling their possessions and dividing with those in need. They worshiped together regularly at the temple each day, met in small groups and homes for communion, shared their meals with great joy and thankfulness, praising God. The whole city was favorable to them, and each day God added to them those that were going to be saved. Now, God has called us to live with the same kind of a witness, witnessing lifestyle that he called these early Christians to live. And we can't take every detail of what was germane in the New Testament and transpose it to today. But basically, we can take the same kind of principles, the same kind of boldness, the same kind of expectation, the same kind of excitement, and we can see that transferred into our lives as well. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. That's why he was given, and that's why he's come to live within our hearts, and that's why Jesus wants us 
to be immersed in his power and presence is so that we can go out and we can do this and we can be his witnesses, okay? Well, let's look at some of the aspects that we can pick out of, discern out of this passage as to what went on with these early Christians. And the first one we're going to talk about we'll call declaration, and you can write in your notes, they witnessed with an earnest boldness. They witnessed with an earnest boldness. Their mouths were unstopped. And it wasn't just their tongues were loosened for, to pr- participate in a heavenly prayer language, although many of them had that experience, but their tongues were loosened so that they might give a bold witness. And so everywhere they went, they began to talk about the Lord. You know, if we love Jesus, and we can talk to people who we meet day by day, we work with, who we live with, who we play with, we can talk with them about anything else. We can talk with them about Jesus. Because it's not that we give them a theological dissertation. It's just simply, we tell what Jesus is doing in our life. That's what our witness is. So if you can talk to them about the lions, which is a pretty sad subject at this particular time, or if you can talk with them about, you know, the weather, or you can talk with them about your children or your grandchildren, well, you can talk about Jesus. This is what Jesus is doing in my life. And, oh, I'm so glad I'm walking with Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus has um, shown me this, and Jesus has shown me that. So, that's what we need to be doing. Now, in the early chapters of the book of Acts, this witness was unquenchable. Uh, Let's just take a survey (coughs) of those early portions. For instance, in Acts chapter uh, 3, we find Peter and John going to the temple, and here's this man that was uh, lame from birth, and under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit, (coughs) he's raised to his feet, and he begins to leap and dance. What a stir was created. Many thousands of people gather. Peter preaches to them. Many people (coughs) respond. The authorities come and arrest them. And uh, they tell them, you can't do this. You can't be speaking in the name of Jesus. And what do they do? Go back home and say, oh dear, we better not do this anymore. No. In the end of chapter 4, they go back. (laughs) They meet with the rest of the people. They rejoice that God is uh, moving in their midst and doing this witness. And they pray to him in unity together until the place is shaken by the Holy Spirit. And what are they praying? Lord, give us more boldness. Let's talk more to more people. Let more miracles take place. Give us more boldness. So, the next day they're arrested again. This time they're beaten. I hope you know that when the Jewish beat people, it wasn't just give them a couple of whacks. It was probably 20 or 30 stripes on the back so that their, their bodies became totally lacerated. It was a horrible thing to go through. Now what happened to these disciples? Did they go back and cower? and think, oh, wallow in self-pity? No, it tells us in uh, chapter 5, the end, it tells us they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer for Jesus. And then they said, daily they were in the temple and house to house, teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. Couldn't stop them. It just went on. No matter what they did, the authorities could not stop this bold witness that was in their hearts. Now, as the Apostle Paul tells us, that we are now God's ambassadors. That's the way he describes what we're supposed to be doing as witnesses. We are now going into this world, into the kingdoms of this world, we're going in, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, whatever else we are doing in life, whatever else happens in our daily schedule and activity, the most important role, the main role, is that we are to give a bold witness. Our mouths are to be unstopped. Like Jesus said, you publicly witness to me, and I will witness before you and the angels. You deny me, and I'll deny you. Jesus wants us to give a public witness. So, as you get up, and as you go about your daily activity, you need to be constantly saying, how should I conduct myself as an ambassador of Jesus today? What should I be saying? How should I be responding? Because I am an ambassador of Jesus today. And the Lord wants us to start this witness, not after we've studied or after we've thought about it or after we've gotten to a certain stage in our spiritual growth. 
He wants to start it, us to start it right now. And so we need to pray, Lord, tomorrow, who is it that you'll have for me to witness to? And the next day we need to pray, Lord, who is it today that you'll have for me to give a witness to? So that we are constantly looking for, praying for opportunities that God will send our way that we can start giving a holy, bold witness, and we need to get started right away this week. Now, one of the things that'll help, and one of the reasons that we've given you an assignment this week uh, that I really hope that you're all going to participate in, is that uh, we need to put together, in a way that we can uh, really get a hold of it, uh, our own personal testimony because that's basically what our witness is. And uh, so, I uh, won't ask you to turn there now, but, but you'll see that the question sheet this week has, as its first question, write a letter of testimony. And this will be the step number one in you beginning <laughs> to prepare yourself to declare a bold witness for Jesus. And uh, I'm going to ask you to think of somebody specifically that you can write this to. I mean... You can write it as a general letter, but it'd be much more effective if you write it to somebody, make a copy of it, and send it to them, or give it to them. As a step number one in beginning to establish a bold witness, because that's what the Holy Spirit has been given in our hearts for, that we would be able to give a bold witness. Now, the second thing you can write that we find in these early Christians uh, participating in, besides declaration was demonstration and uh, as they demonstrated <coughs> they exhibited an expectant faith write that in your notes please they exhibited an expectant faith now Jesus had told his disciples as recorded in the last chapter of Mark that they were to go out and they were to give the, the witness and when they had given this witness then signs would follow them and those who believed who were baptized would be saved. And as they went, he said, you will use my authority. And then he listed, he said, you'll cast out demons. You'll speak in unknown languages. You'll handle snakes and they won't bite you or, or poison you. You'll drink poison and it won't affect you. And not only that, you'll lay hands on people and, and pray for them and they'll be healed. All of these things will take place, Jesus said. So the early disciples went out and they began to do these things. Now, there's a couple of things I need to talk with you about here. What's this snake business? Well, there are some cults down in the southern part of our country that have taken this out of context and blown it way out of proportion. And they think the sign as to the fact that they're filled with the Holy Spirit is that they can handle snakes, poisonous snakes. And uh, they won't be affected. Well, of course, sometimes they are, and people have been bitten and died and so forth. Jesus isn't talking about putting on a snake handling show. You know what Jesus is talking about? Here's the Apostle Paul. He's shipwrecked in the last chapter of the book of Acts, along with the other people who were on his boat. <laughs> they get safely to land, all wet and needing to dry off. So they all begin to gather firewood and driftwood to make a fire. And Paul's part of it. And he has this bundle of driftwood, brings it over to the fire, and as he's getting ready to put it on the fire, a very poisonous viper comes out of it and bites him on the hand. He shakes it off into the fire. Now the people of the island, the inhabitants, who had now gathered around to see what was going on with these shipwrecked people, saw this happen. They knew the deadly poison that was in that viper, and they expected within a half hour he would blow it up, writhe, and die. When nothing happened, <laughs> then they thought he's a god, and they, now they wanted to worship him. That's what Jesus was talking about. You go out and you give this bold declaration, and then you show the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to protect you. I, I talk with people in India who when they came to the Lord, their, parent, their, their family was so upset that they tried all kinds of ways to stop them from being, becoming Christians. And part of that was that they tried to put them to death by poison. And this has happened down through history. This is what 
he's talking about. When these things take place, then people will sit up and take notice and they will know that what you're saying has some merit to it. There's some power to back it up. And so it says at the end of that passage that as they went out and they began to declare these things, then lo and behold, the Lord was with them and confirmed what they said by signs and miracles that were taking place. In that passage we were talking about, it says in verse 43, a deep sense of awe was on them and the disciples did many miracles. I can almost see, you can almost read between the lines here and see that they're sitting, <coughs> basically they're sitting on the edge of their seat wondering what in the world is going to happen next. What's God going to do next? That's the way it should be when God's people come together and when the, Lord, the, the, the kingdom of the Lord is going forth. Now, if we don't have a supernatural God to back up the message that we're bringing, then what do we have that's effective for the world? Not very much. If there is a message that we want people to believe, but we don't have anything to really meet their needs, their baby's sick, we don't have anything for that, that that's going to make a difference there, uh, they're strung, strung out on drugs, we don't have anything that's going to make a difference there, uh, their uh, emotions are all messed up, we don't have anything that's going to make a difference there, and uh, they're troubled by an evil spirit, they have a lust they can't shake free from, and all we can do is tell them, talk to them, give them something that they can understand in their mind, but we don't have any power to back it up, what good is it going to do? The early disciples went out, and as they went, they told the message, but behind the message came this demonstration of the power of God. What we hear and what we tell people doesn't have the power to back it up and meet these needs. What's it going to do? For instance, let me just tell you, in the land of Tanzania, which is one of the African uh, countries, <clears throat> Muslim country, basically, the Iranian oil money is being poured into that country. And the Muslim people uh, and missionaries are coming in and they're creating these stupendous mosques, colossal mosques. They're giving food and money to people who will convert to uh, Islam. And what are the Christian missionaries going to do? I mean, they don't have millions of dollars. They can't build these huge mosques. They don't give money to people so that they will convert. They're just poor. They're living hand to mouth. They hardly have enough even to go to the next community to witness for Jesus. What do they have if they don't have the power? What do they have if they, don't, if they can't come and lay hands on somebody's mother who's sick and they're healed? Or somebody's leg is broken and they lay hands on them and they're healed? Or somebody's demon-possessed and they lay hands on them, and they're cast out, and the demon is cast out, and they're in their right mind. Then the money doesn't matter. Then all this stuff that the Muslims are pouring into the country doesn't matter. Then people will give attention to the Christian message. But if there isn't a power there that is greater than any power in Islam or any other religious experience, if there isn't any other, then people, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to go where the money is. They're going to go where the ostentatious buildings are. So if the Christian doesn't have this power to back it up, then their witness is not very effective. Not very effective at all. For years, the church had lost this sense of power. For years, the church did survive, of course. The church did move forward. <clears throat> but it was all on the intellectual level. It was all on the devotional level. But there wasn't the power there. Thank God we live in the day and age when the Holy Spirit has once again, as we told you last week, been restored. The understanding of the Spirit has been restored. And now people are receiving the gift that Jesus had promised. They're being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And signs and wonders are beginning to take place again. Notice in your notes, this is the way it was in the book of Acts. In the early part of the book of Acts, notice in Acts chapter 2, here was a supernatural manifestation of tongues on the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> people were astounded. What happened? 3,000 people were saved. In Acts chapter 3, there was this healing at the temple gate. People were amazed how many, 
resulted. 5,000 people were saved. In Acts chapter 5, there were miracles, all kinds of miracles, and many people believed. In Acts chapter 8, there were more miracles taking place up in Antioch, and many people were baptized. In Acts chapter 9, a dead person was raised. The whole town was believed. In Acts chapter 13, the governor of the island of Malta saw a miracle take place right before his eyes, and he believed. In Acts chapter 14, there were great miracles that proved the message of the gospel. Now, the next verse in your notes is the verse I love. It comes from Hebrews chapter 2, 4. Look at it with me, will you? God always has shown that the messages are true by signs and wonders and various miracles and by giving certain special abilities from the Holy Spirit to those who believe. Yes, God has assigned such gifts to each of us. Now look at that verse carefully. God has always done this, it says. This has been his way. And he has given these signs and wonders, these ability to do these miracles, to all of us, to each of us. Who were these people that went out, these early evangelists? They were people just like us. They were people who had accepted the promise of Jesus. I'll immerse you in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. You'll go forth in my name, and these things will happen. And they were, who were they? They were retail clerks. They were garbage collectors. They were bricklayers. They were just the common, ordinary people like you and I. And as they witnessed, what happened? Lives were changed. Bodies were healed. Needs were met. Raging tempers were still. Vicious foul mouths were cleansed. Anxiety and frustration was quieted. Prayers were answered. And the wonderful power of God was displayed. Now, why don't we see this happening more? I think the answer is this. Belief releases. Unbelief prohibits. You know those sad words that were said over Jesus' own hometown? When he came there and they rejected him and they wouldn't believe in him? And it says he, even Jesus, was not able to do many great things in his hometown because of their unbelief. Unbelief is like a blanket that Satan puts on. And many times unbelief comes either from it wasn't in my background, it wasn't in my tradition, or it comes from the intellectual level. No, stuff like that can't happen. There's no reasonable, rational explanation for it. Well, whatever the source of unbelief is, where unbelief prevails, then God's activity is is prohibited, is, is, is not able to be freely seen. But where belief comes, then the sky is the limit. All kinds of things can take place. Jesus said, or it says in Hebrews, that God always has backed up his ministry with these kinds of signs and wonders. And people are looking for something real. They want to know that God is alive today and moving amongst his people. And let me just tell you some illustrations of this. <clears throat> My son-in-law was raised in Pakistan. His, folks were, his parents were missionaries there amongst the Muslim people. Very, very difficult, very hard. Worked a lifetime, just a handful. Another fellow group missionary family was there. And this other missionary family worked 20 years, and I think they had like, you could count on their fingers, your fingers, how many people they had been able to win to Christ in those 20 years. And then they heard about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And their hearts were hungry and open. And they received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now they began to pray for people. They were healed. Now they began to speak with a new boldness and power and an unction from the Holy Spirit. And within a few months, far more people came to the Lord and the church was growing and established now because it was now under the power of the Holy Spirit. Then before, in those 20 years, when they worked just as hard as they possibly could and served the Lord with every ounce of their energy, but... It wasn't that effective. Why is it, do you suppose, that China, after the bamboo curtain came down, missionaries couldn't go in any longer? We didn't know what was going on there in the land of China. Why is it that this now, today, there are millions of Christians in China? It's simply because it was like the New Testament. The people there, the Chinese people, 
they, be, they, be, they, they began to witness to the Lord Jesus. And they did it quietly. And everybody in their village knew if there was a baby that was sick, they knew where to take the baby. If there was somebody who was demon-possessed, they knew where to take the person who was demon-possessed. And there was a power in these simple lives and in their prayers and in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a power that backed up whatever word they gave. And so tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands and then millions of Chinese began to give their heart to the Lord with no big ministry coming, no big evangelist, no big movement of God, no organization, just the people beginning to describe what was going on. I had an experience when I first came to Michigan, after the Holy Spirit had poured out on our former church here in Monroe, and a number of the young people in the church, as I told you uh, a couple weeks ago or last week, had begun to find the Lord and become to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I was asked to direct a camp for like middle, middle high kids up in northern Michigan. And we got up there, we had great expectations. A number of uh, these young people, college age young people, went up with me to act as counselors. And we just believed God was going to pour out his spirit on that place. It was going to be marvelous. Well, we got up there, and it had rained for a whole day. It was continuing to rain. It was 40 degrees. You know what it's like in northern Michigan at 40 degrees when it rains and rains? Or you couldn't do anything outside. It was just, and this was the beginning of camp, the first day of camp. Well, what had happened was there was a, a cabin full of boys that had come from an inner city, one of our inner cities up there, and uh, they expected that they were going to have quite a week, and uh, they were going to really disrupt the place. Not only that, but they had brought drugs along with them, and uh, we found out through the grapevine that this had happened, and uh, we counselors were meeting God, what are we going to do? It's a Christian camp. We can't have drugs passed around in our camp. How are we going to find this? And one of the girls who was a counselor said, well, I just came out of the drug scene. I'll tell you what, if you keep the kids here, I'll go to that cabin. I guarantee you I'll find those drugs. We didn't feel freedom in our spirit to put that into play right away. And so we said, okay, let's give it tonight. And then in the morning, uh, we'll keep them here for breakfast and you go do that. Well, God had other plans. And what happened was this. We've been praying. We've been asking God to really show up in this camp. This cabin of boys had spent the whole day trying to light a fire in their fireplace. And it was jam-packed with wet wood. That's all they could find. Every dry scrap they had used, every piece of paper, every car, they poured kerosene on. They had tried all day long to light the fire. Well, it was time for them to go to bed, and they were... This one kid was lying in his bunk, and he said, very facetiously, he said, God, we're cold, light our fire. Boom, that fireplace went just like that. <laughs> I mean, it just burst into flames. Well, when those kids picked themselves off the ceiling, they were down on their knees, repenting, giving their heart to the Lord. Pretty soon, they went out in the middle of the rain, running around in the camp, God lit our fire, God lit our fire. The girls' cabins had known what was going on, and they had been praying for them. Pretty soon, the girls were out there in the middle of the rain. I mean, it was bedlam, running around, God lit our fire, God's... And then, and we didn't know what was, this was in those days. We had never experienced this before. They began to fall under the power of the Spirit. Out there in the rain, the mud, fall down, and we thought, we've got to get the rescue squad out here. We don't know what's happening. Well, I want to tell you, God showed up. We didn't have to go find those drugs. They brought them the next morning. And every one of those kids gave their heart to the Lord that week. You see, when God comes, just now, right this last year, in uh, Redding, California, where Bill Johnson's ministry of Bethel, Bethel Church is, uh, <clears throat> they have a school, not only the church, they have a school of supernatural ministry there have 300 students that come. And they train people uh, to receive and apply the supernatural ministry of God, the kingdom of God on earth today. And Bill Johnson was telling about this one young man, whose name is Jason, who is part of this school of ministry. And uh, Jason was at a fast food restaurant getting something, and he was witnessing to the cashier as he was getting it. And behind him, there was three men that drove up in the <clears throat> car, and they were through the 
the window there, the drive-up window, and he started talking past the uh, cashier, and he started talking to them and telling them about the Lord. And uh, then uh, he got his meal and uh, went out, and he saw that they had gotten their meal, and they went and parked. And so he went over to continue the conversation. And so he was talking with them, and uh, they looked in the car, and the guy in the back seat, he could see he had a broken leg. So he got in the car, and, uh, and he asked the Holy Spirit to show up. And the Holy Spirit showed up. And the guy started cursing because he didn't know about the fire of God on his leg. He didn't know what that was. Well, pretty soon they all piled out of the car, and he took his brace off, and he stopped his leg. He was totally healed. The next thing they did was they opened their trunk, and they brought out all these illegal drugs that were there, and they danced on the drugs and ruined them, and <clears throat> rejoiced in what was happening, and he led all three of them to the Lord right there. Now, what were the chances that this young man could have walked up to that car of drug dealers and started talking to them about Jesus and be, had a hearing, even paid any kind of attention? But God showed up. And when God showed up, then the barriers were down. The, the declaration of the gospel, as wonderful as it is, must be backed up by the demonstration of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And then things will begin to take place. Look at the verse there at the bottom of your page. It comes out of Romans. <clears throat> it's like Paul is giving here in chapter 15, sort of just a quick autobiographical statement about himself. And he says, uh, <clears throat> he says, God has used me to win the Gentiles. And he, here's what he says. I have won them by my message and by the good way I have lived before them and by the miracles done through me as signs from God. All by the Holy Spirit's power. Now notice, the Holy Spirit's power here accomplished three things in the life of the Apostle Paul. First of all, he said, it was the message. I won these people by the message I preached. Secondly, he said, I won them by the life that I lived. And that was the Spirit's power, enabling him to live the life. And then he said, and by the signs and wonders that were done by the Holy Spirit. And then he got, went on to conclude, in this way, I have preached the full gospel of Christ all the way from Jerusalem clear over to Eliquium. Another translation says, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. What's involved in fully preaching the gospel of Christ? What I've said, what I've done, and the signs and miracles. Praise God. And so this bold witness went forth. Declaration and demonstration, hand in hand, and it made a tremendous impact. Okay, let's look at the third uh, effect or third um, element in this uh, alternate lifestyle, and we're going to call this stewardship. And will you write in your notes, they experienced a financial revolution. We look in the New Testament in these early chapters, and what we see is a new economics taking place here. Now, it's not capitalist economics. It's not communist economics. It's kingdom economics. In Acts 4.33, it says, no one felt that what they owed, owned was their own. Well, that's a pretty incredible statement. No one felt that what they owned was their own. Then the next couple of verses later, in Acts 2.44 and 45, as it says there in your notes, and all the believers met together constantly and shared everything with each other, selling their possessions and dividing with those that are in need. Now, does that mean that God's plan for economics is that everybody pulls all their stuff together and kind of live communally? No, I don't believe so. But I want to tell you, in this instance, that was what was happening. Let me explain to you. These people had come from many parts of the known world of that day, most of them as pilgrims, probably coming for the holy days in Jerusalem. And they had saved up for this, and they had planned for the trip, and here they came, and then they got far more than they ever bargained for. They heard about Jesus. They accepted him. They became part of the early church. But they had only planned to stay two weeks or three weeks or maybe a month at the most. And their funds were running out. They had lots of funds back home, but they, you know, you couldn't go to an ATM in those days. And they didn't have any way of getting those funds. So what happened? The people who had resources, who lived nearby, 
If they had some jewelry, they sold it. If they had a piece of land, they sold it. They brought it to the apostles' feet, and everybody's needs were taken care of. Now, when these people went back home, which they did, they took up their jobs again. They went about their daily activities again. God said that he didn't want lazy people in his kingdom. He wanted people to work so that they might be able to eat. He wanted them to be frugal and productive in their work life, in their ec economics life. But the thing that they learned was this. Whatever they had wasn't theirs. And they proved that. Because those who had were willing to give so that the needs of others will be taken care of. Now, this is one of the most powerful witnesses that you can give. When your care for people and what your, your life with the Lord Jesus affects your pocketbook, it makes a huge witness. We live in a grasping, materialistic society. Everybody's out for as much as they can get. Jesus knew that the biggest impediment he would have to capturing the attention and loyalty of people would be their money and their material possessions. And so he spoke more about this than any other subject. The Jewish people, the religious Jewish people, felt that a person's accumulation of possessions indicated the spirituality of their life. If you were a really good person, you would be wealthy. Isn't it amazing that that same thing's been picked up and presented in a different guise here in our day by the prosperity teachers who somehow teach, if you have faith, that you can ask God, you can claim from God, and you can be rich. You can drive a Cadillac. You can do this, you can do that. Totally self-centered. Totally materialistic. Not at all what God had in mind with the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Don't be sucked in by that kind of thinking. They wanted all that they could get. I, I was just talking with someone this week who was telling me about a family, a part of their family uh, members, who are Christians, but they have, of late years, they have just gotten such a desire for money that money is dominating their life. They're not pressing on with the Lord anymore. They're not doing what... They used to do with the Lord, but they're just trying to get ahead, trying to get as much money as they can. Jesus knew that would be his greatest competitor, and the society in which we live promotes this. It's a grasping society. The kingdom of God is a sharing society, not a grasping society, a sharing society. And when people like these early Christians are willing to give what they have, to take care of the needs of other people who are their brothers and sisters in Christ. When they are willing to give liberally to the kingdom of God rather than accumulate for themselves, it makes an impression. I want to tell you, our church, Redeemer Church, met for the first ten and a half years of our existence in a school, Cantor Junior High School. And there were people related to people in our church who worked at Ford Motor Company, and here's the word that went around. The, their relatives, Ford Motor Company re employees were really upset because these crazy relatives of theirs went to this church that met in a school. I mean, who ever heard of a church that met in a school in the first place? Not only that, but they gave 10% of their income to that church, that, that bunch that didn't even have a church. They were meeting in a school. To them, that was a scandal. But it sure got their attention. It was God's people putting him first, putting their material possessions on the altar for him, and God was using that. If you find people who are willing to take their last nickel and care for their Christian brothers, you'll find people who have a dynamic witness. And most of the people around will look at what's going on in their lives and they'll say, wow, that is really something. I can hardly believe that. Now, the fourth uh, aspect that we'll talk about is simply this. It's composition. We're going to call it composition, and you write down, they formed into a committed community. Their hunger for God for each other's fellowship led them to do certain things. 
And we're going to look at these. And again, you can write these as we list them. The first thing it led them to do was they joined with each other, with other believers and regular attendance of the apostles' teaching sessions. Eager study. Put that in your notes. This forming together into a committed com- community, one expression of that was eager study. They wanted all that God had for them. Wouldn't it have been great if we could have been a mouse in the corner and sat in on some of those studies? Well, actually, literally, we can do that because I believe what they were teaching, we now have in written down form in the New Testament. So as we study our New Testament, (coughs) we're getting what they were getting. And they were learning about Jesus and about his life. (coughs) They were a hungry bunch. One of the reasons that I get so much joy in giving, doing full life in Christ is because I get to work with a hungry bunch. I mean, nobody would come week after week give two and a half hours of their night unless they were hungry for the Lord and wanted to know what God had for them and wanted to be able to participate in it their lives. They're so rewarding to talk with hungry people. And I've talked to plenty of others who weren't, who sat in pews and wondered why in the world they were there. I had some people who would read a book while I was preaching because they didn't want to hear what was being said. I mean, that's no fun. But I haven't seen any of you. You're sitting there, you're eager, you're looking, you're just wanting to receive what God has. This is the way they were in the New Testament. They were eager for all that God would give them. You know, so one day I was reading through this uh, description in these verses 42 to 47, of Acts chapter 2. And I saw this they did, and this they did, and this they did, and I thought, well, my goodness, don't they ever go to church? And then finally, I found it back in, down in verse 20, 46. And this is actually seven different, seven things down the line. And it says, yeah, they went to church. In fact, they worship regularly at the temple every day. Oh, well, that must be a misprint, I thought. I mean, Sundays? No, they said every day they worshiped. And I thought, my goodness, they did go to church, didn't they? And then I remembered hearing about the land of Korea. Do you know that it's approaching, if it hasn't passed over, the fact that 50% of the population of South Korea are vital Christians? And you know, for almost 50 years, if you would go to one of the major cities in Korea, you would find early in the morning, before the sun has come up, beautiful music, thrilling combination of voices coming from this church here and this church building here and this church building here as God's people get together for a couple hours before they go out to their farms, before they go to their shops or whatever, to worship God and praise him and pray. This has been going on for 50 years. No wonder Korea is almost a Christian nation. What would happen in our country if that began to take place, huh? They did regularly meet together and worship the Lord. Not only that, but often they got together for, right in your notes, what we call agape feasts. These are intimate times of love where they had a meal together and then they took communion together. And these were times to love Jesus and to love each other These were times when they remembered their bonds in the Lord, the things that knit them together. And these were also times when they had to get right with each other or they wouldn't really be able to take communion together. And so there was a huge depository of love and goodwill and the bonding of spirit that took place as they sat together around the table of the Lord and began to fellowship. Sometimes I think that we in our traditions are amiss because... We downplay almost the table of the Lord. It isn't nearly as central in our lives as it probably was for those early Christians. We once a month <laughs> take communion. You know, I, I had an experience where in the early days of the move of the Holy Spirit, I happened to be in Houston and went to the Church of the Redeemer, which was an uh, Episcopal church down there. And amongst other things were absolutely amazing to me as they had a Eucharist every noon. They call it Eucharist. And in this time of Eucharist, 
they would sing and rejoice and they would dance before the Lord. It was such a joyful, wonderful time. And then they thank God for Jesus for his death. They received the elements. It was such an upbuilding thing and people would come on their lunch hour and participate. It was glorious. And I think sometimes we miss out. These early Christians, they had these agape feasts. Regularly they came together. And the last thing you can write is they were a supportive fellowship. They needed each other. Now, if you think it's hard for you to be a witness for Christ where he's put you in your neighborhood, in your job situation or whatever, in your school, wherever you are, if you think it's hard for you to be a witness for the Lord today, just think what it was like for these people. <coughs> I mean, they were discriminated against. They were the off-scouring of the earth. They were... Uh, they had no rights, no job security, and uh, they were usually given the worst jobs. They were just made fun of, and life was made miserable for them. Here's a guy. He works in a pottery factory. He spent the whole day doing all the dirty jobs in the pottery factory, you know, being the butt of people's jokes, uh, being imposed upon constantly and he's at the end of the day he's just bone weary and his spirit is all bruised and he goes home and he says mother mother we got to get with the brothers tonight put some bread and some cheese in a basket and let's go so they went where the brothers were meeting and here others had gathered and they began to share their little meager supper together and they began to tell about their day and they began to witness and to each other and encourage each other and the gifts of the holy spirit began to flow and some had a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge and some had a prophecy pretty soon they worshiped together then they broke bread and had communion together and two hours later it was like he was a new man his whole being was now healed and enabled and enlivened again and he was able to go back to that old pottery shop the next day they needed each other sometimes we have such a take-it-or-leave-it attitude. If it's convenient, we'll come. If it isn't, we won't. We don't really have a bonding that unites us together. And I wonder if God isn't going to change our outward circumstances, even here in America, to the point where we're under enough pressure so we got to have each other. Maybe it would be a good thing for the church if we had to have each other. Now it's optional. We can take it or leave it. But they needed each other. They had to have each other. And so they did. Now, when you get this combination together, what do you have? Write it in your notes. You have authentic Christianity. That's what this produces. Larry Tomsek defines authentic Christianity as coming under the loving lordship of Jesus Christ and being joined to a company of imperfect people who are learning to live life in a new way. That's what authentic Christianity is all about. Now, at the bottom of your page, here's a couple of paragraphs from Dr. Howard Keeley. And I think we have time just to quickly read this over together. Let's do that. You follow along with me, will you? Christ told us we are to be his witnesses. The early church burned like a fire and spread rapidly because of the contagion of its people. They had found a risen Christ and they were excited about him. They couldn't keep quiet. They witnessed by what they were, what they did, and what they said. People saw a change in them because of Christ, a change for the better. And they wanted this faith and new life. These early Christians had somehow learned how to get their faith over to others. They met a pagan world. They met daily life. They met martyrdom, all with a radiant faith. They were different from any other people on earth. If what you love is horse racing or clothes or the stock market or your grandchildren, that's what you'll talk about. If what you love is Jesus, is Christ, you'll find ways to talk about him to other people. You can't make half-dead church members enthusiastic witnesses, and you can't keep people who have begun to know Christ from beginning to live for him and talk about him. And so does the great contagion spread. In this passage that we've been looking at, there are three results of this contagious witness. Let's look at them. The first one is this, right in your notes, a healthy sense of awe. A deep sense of awe was on them all, and the apostles did many wonders. Uh, some translations say the fear of the Lord was upon them or the fear of God was on them. You know, fear can be a quaking kind of experience. It also can be an overwhelming awe experience. And that's the kind of fear 
that is being talked about here. It's the sense that you don't want to do anything impure in the presence of this mighty God. You don't want to do anything that will displease him in this mighty God. And when God is moving, the result is a healthy awe. People are saying, have you heard what's happened there? Do you think that's real? Can you believe it? Wow, isn't this something? That is healthy. That's what God wants to see happening, and that was the result. The second you can write is a positive impression on the city. Praising God, the whole city was favorable to them, and each day God added to them all that were being saved. Here was the people who really knew how to praise the Lord. There was a sense of joy about them. Now, joy isn't a giddiness. Joy isn't a slap-happy kind of thing. There's some people who are just extroverts. They're always bubbling all over the place. That isn't what's being talked about here. A sense of joy, a praise for the Lord, is just a deep well within of peace and contentment and knowing that things are in God's hands. The joy of the Lord. Let me ask you this. Who would you rather spend your time with? A person who's full of joy or a person who's grouching all the time? A person who's always looking on the dark side of life? A person who constantly has discouragement? You avoid that person, don't you, if you possibly can. I mean, they drag you down. But people who are filled with joy and happiness, especially the joy of the Lord, you just, there's something contagious about them. You just want to be around them. That's the way it is. You know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, we are to be a sweet-smelling savor out there in the world. We're, we're to bring the perfume. We're to bring the very fragrance of God into the midst of people. And you know what that fragrance is? It's love and joy and peace that well up from within our lives. That's what God wants us to produce. Not only that, but as we've said to you before, <clears throat> They had favor because a social miracle was happening before people's eyes. And uh, <clears throat> the world had never seen anything like this before. People loving and trusting and caring and treating each other as equals who had no reason to do that. And this was such a good testimony. So here it was. They <clears throat> had uh, the re first result was that there was a healthy sense of awe. Oh, man, God is at work. Second thing was, they had a positive impression on the city. And the third was this. Write it down. Every day, people were being saved. I mean, every day. Each day, God had added to them. And more and more believers were added to the Lord. Crowds, both of men and women, it says in Acts 5. And the number of disciples increased vastly in Jerusalem, Acts chapter 6. What was going on? Well, let's just review a moment. Here were these early Christians... They were giving a bold witness. They had a powerful demonstration of the power of the Spirit backing up that witness. They had engaged in a financial revolution, so now they were a caring society rather than a grasping society. And they were supporting fellowship. Now, when you get these things together, what do you have? Dynamite? Yeah, you have spiritual dynamite. You have something even more than that. You have something that's totally infectious. How is it that measles spreads? And why is it that when measles comes, you know, people are kept home? Chicken pox kept home. Kids are kept home. Because if they rub up against or play with their friends, what happens? They come down with the measles. They come down with chicken pox. That's the way it is with the Christians. That's the way it is with this alternate lifestyle. You rub up against your neighbors. You rub up against the people around you that God brings into your life, they get it. It's infectious. It just comes. Now, that's what the Lord wants to do as he spreads this contagion. Now, there's one more thing I need to share with you, and this is really important. God has a plan to evangelize the world. He has a plan to reach all nations. He has a plan to make disciples of every people. And I want to tell you it's important that you understand God's plan. Because his plan is not wrapped up in Billy Graham or Benny Hinn or Brother Jakes. 
or Pat Robertson, his plan is not wrapped up in pastors or evangelists or teachers. But I want you to write big and bold at the bottom of your plane, his plan is us. Filling us with his spirit, building us into a family, a community of God on earth, releasing us out in society. That's the way the kingdom of God will grow. And that is why he said, I have a birthday gift for you and I want you to be filled with, I want you to be empowered by the Holy Spirit so you can go and do it. Because without his help, we'll not be able to do it. Without his life flowing through us, we'll not be able to do it. But this is our job. And God wants each of us to be in, in, involved in it. And wouldn't it be great if you could come back after the Christmas break and give a testimony as to how God enabled you to start establishing a witness in a new way because of what we've shared with together tonight. Let's see if God can't do that, okay? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that you have, in the lifestyle illustration of these early Christians, shown us the elements that go to make up the spirit-filled lifestyle. Father, we pray that you'll burn them into our heart. We pray that you'll help us to realize that the Holy Spirit is there to enable us to walk in all of this to give this example, this demonstration to the world around us of what a true, authentic Christian is really like. And may we do it, Lord, with eagerness and the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.